approximately uh, last year, I don't know exactly when it was, but, um, and it really shouldn't matter when it was, I think it was somewhere near May or June, June or July, somewhere, I don't really recall when it was, but it was definitely before August, that's for sure, I know, it. I think it was May or June, uh, that one day the Lord woke me up and he individually picked up seven people beside myself, and he says, you're going to go, these eight people are going to go to Victoria. And you guys are going to go to Victoria, and you're going to pray. And everything that you guys are going to declare is going to take place. And, uh, and so I, I called these individuals, and of course some of these individuals were thinking I have, uh, you know, they say, wow, you know, God really cares about these things, you know. Uh, and, you know, it's okay, uh, you know. And I said, well, God does care about these things. And, we, and God made, made, uh, prepared the, the, the ways for all of those things. And um, we went to Victoria, uh, these eight and in seven individuals plus myself that the Lord had selected. And the Lord gave us a few promises. He says, you guys, going to, I'm going to change the whole way that uh, Canada and, uh, is going to be dealing with this whole COVID issue. I'm going to remove all the restrictions. I'm going to open up the country. And it will be done in seven, time, seven day time from the moment you guys are going to go there. And so, and we went, and uh, we did what the Lord had asked us to do. He told us, go there, and he says, deal with the spirit of witchcraft and idol worship as well while you're there in Victoria, because there is a center of idol worship and, we, and, and, and witchcraft, and go deal with these things. And we went, and we obeyed. We didn't advertise it in church. We haven't spoken in church about this. Here and there, maybe we hinted on some stuff. But um, it is necessary today for me to share this because the Lord wanted me to give us the testimony of our lips and the fruit of His, His work in the kingdom of God that He's doing on earth. Amen? Amen. And you know what? And uh, God has a kingdom and He rules as a king and His kingdom shall not perish. Amen? Amen. His kingdom shall not perish and it's from everlasting to everlasting. Amen? Whether people will believe in it, believe in him or not, whether they falsely confess him or not, what it is done, it is done. It is sealed. Because the Bible says one thing very amazingly. Not the Bible. The world does something amazingly, which is true, actually. And uh, it is true, by the way, just in case you don't believe in it. When the cops arrest somebody, they say, everything that you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. Okay? Good or bad, your benefit or not. They said, you have the right to be and remain silent. Everything that you say can and will be used against you. They didn't say for you, against you in the court of law. Guess what? There is also a court in heaven. <laughs> that everything that we confess, it will have weight to it. And it will take care of it. And things will happen. Now, I'm going to share with you a few things that happened that day because I do believe that there's enough, that, that we have seen enough testimonies to the Lord has released me to share. Because sometimes you share stuff and people, oh, you're crazy. They come against, you know, they say, no, this cannot be, this cannot happen. Well, those of you who were there, there, they can testify of this. Exactly a week time for the time we went to the parliament and we start releasing the sound of God, the government remove all its restriction over Canada, over BC. And we did not even need to do a, work, a, a thing. We just went to the courts of heaven and we brought the authority of God into our parliament in Victoria, representing all the parliaments. And we took over that whole area without worrying about anything, knowing the promise of the Lord is yes and amen. amen. And all the COVID restrictions, all the things just dropped. We were just praising God. We were, not, we were not astonished by it because we knew what God says will happen. And then, of course, uh, on Tuesday, uh, we were meeting uh, with Sister Daisy and her husband uh, and her daughter that is visiting from U.S. at her house. And, and uh, we were talking, and she shared with us, she says, you know, Pastor, after we went to Victoria, they've been trying to rebuild the temple in uh, Victoria, the, the Chinese Buddhist temple, for almost 10 years. And after we went there, the day, the next day, 
they put a, they put a request for demolition of the temple because for 10 years they're trying to fix it and they cannot fix it. And they, they put a request for demolition of it. And actually, last week just got approved <laughs> that they're going to demolish the temple. <laughs> and the temple is no longer going to be there and it's going to be used for different purposes. They're not going to build another temple. They're just going to build something new. So guess what? God again dealt with the idol worship that is taking place and it's going around. The next thing happened was, actually it was at a time when um, Queen Elizabeth passed away and they had this, we went into the parliament and we saw they had this thing that they were having to write. And, um, and the Lord uh, impressed on my heart, says, write these things down. We need to write these things down, right? And, you know, my, my handwriting is a chicken scratch. Barely people can read it. I can barely read it sometimes. So I got my, my, my beloved to write for me. So I got uh, Z to sit down, and I was, you know, telling her, and she was writing it down. And uh, actually, Pastor Siam got a good picture of it. She captured the moment, you know, from the back. Uh, she took the picture of it, uh, what was been happening. And the Lord impressed on my heart. He says, S write these things down, that... Jesus Christ is the King of kings, and he's the Lord of lords, and he's going to rule over all the nations, including Canada. And Charles, you are under his authority, and we are under his authority. And that's what has to be bestowed upon you. And we honor him only when you honor him. Amen? Amen. And uh, well and behold... Whether he believes it or not, it's not up for question. That's why I said, what you say will, can, and will be used against you in the courts of heaven and on earth. And by the way, God works in the kingdom. He's not a democratic God. I've never seen God being democratic because he says he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He has a kingdom. He doesn't have a monarch. He doesn't have a, uh, what we call today, uh, democratic uh, nations, right? But that's another subject that we will talk about it because that's also part of the, uh, our rebellious will, not wanting to be the king uh, and wanting to be, uh, uh, don't want to submit to his rules and his uh, domain. That's why we want to be, uh, you know, uh, democratic. We want to tell God what to do. We don't tell God, they don't allow God to do what, what us to do. So here's the deal. Here's the wonderful deal. I was watching the, uh, the, the uh, coronation of uh, Charles, and I heard exact words coming from the priest's mouth. King of kings, Lord of lords, this crown that I hold in my hand is, belongs to you, and you rule over Charles, and you are the king of all of us. Amen. Amazing. Isn't it how God works? And he... Re, he responded likewise, that he is the king of kings and I'm under his authority and he's the Lord and savior of my life. Now, whether he believes it or not, it's not for me to come here this morning and say, well, whatever. It was made a public confession. Worldwide seen it. Worldwide heard it. But also heaven heard it. And if he doesn't obey by those rules, there is. A judgment. There is a, what God will do towards all of these things. And we need to be able to celebrate Jesus to know that he still rules. That he is not, he is not worried about all these things that we might be worried about. He is actually moving so strategically and he moves with individuals around the globe doing what he only can do. And when he moves, it's so powerful. It is, needs to be fulfilled. What did Jesus say when he was getting baptized? What did he say? All righteousness has to be fulfilled. What does all righteousness that has to be fulfilled mean to us? To many of you guys, well, you know what? It's, it's, it's all about, you know, doing the will of God. That's correct. It means we need to go through everything that God wants us to go through. That includes that we need, he needed to pick up the cross and bear the cross and crucify himself for our sake. Isn't it amazing? We might not call that righteousness, but he bore the sins of all of us. He became sinful so that we can be delivered. 
how many of us this morning are willing to become sinful that everybody else can be delivered? I'm glad you answered no, because you shouldn't. <laughs> None of us should, because it's not our job, it's his job. We shouldn't, we shouldn't become sinful for nobody, but we should be totally in the liberation and all that he's doing. And uh, so yesterday, it was so amazing. Yesterday was a day of challenge and uh, moving. The Lord was moving in so many different ways that uh, I, I, I love him so much, you know, because uh, when the challenges of life uh, faces you, the thing that you do is most of the time you're always trying to withdraw yourself from, from the world, you know. And, and I was, I was saying, I said, Lord, because, you know, the enemy talks to you. You know, as much as the, the Lord talks to you, the enemy talks to you. You know, it's hopeless. Don't do it. Forget about it. You need to quit all of these things. You know, whatever it is, right? And uh, I was talking to a brother yesterday, and I said, you know, <laughs> it's funny. I said, I said, you have no idea. I have everything I did today was just wrong. <laughs> everything just wrong. And and this brother says, me too, you know. I said, well, praise God that we are both in the same boat, you know. I said, <laughs> I said at least I know I'm not suffering by myself. And I, and I told this brother, I said, you know what, I put myself in a timeout. I said, I'm not going to leave the house one more minute because everything I do is wrong. <laughs> everything I do, it just goes wrong, you know. It doesn't matter what I do, it's wrong. I have nothing left in me. Everything is wrong. And... Um, and while I put myself in a time out of worshiping God, not putting myself in a time out of, of, of seeking my own desire, uh, and the Lord, uh, you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was lengthy, I'm telling you. It was a battle that was lengthy. And I said, Lord, I need a ream of word that agrees with the Logos. Because, you know what, I shared this with you guys before. If Rhema does not agree with Logos, it's not the Word of God. It's as simple as that. It has to be because Jesus, our Lord and Savior, says, as it's written, as it has been said, everything that he said, he was saying it, it is already written. I'm just telling you how you need to be expanded. I'm just opening your understanding. I'm showing you the fulfillment of it. I'm showing how these things have been written. And, and continuously, all the apostles, they say, same thing, as you have heard, as you have heard, as you have heard. So the revelation comes out of the rhema together with the logos. Together becomes revelation. Amen? And I said, God, I'm not satisfied. I'm not going to move until I receive such a word. And the Lord gave me a word, gave, gave the word in prayer. And it was so liberating in so many different ways that it brought all the texts in, uh, in understanding and in context for me. And he said these words. He said, I'm not looking for you to sacrifice yourself for nobody. By doing that, you are coming against my sacrifice. Think about it. I'm not looking for you to sacrifice yourself for nobody or anything. Because by doing that, you're coming against my sacrifice. And I said, okay, Lord, text, text, text. I need now to have the logos. I know this is the rainbow. I need a, and the Lord says, what did I tell my servant Moses? The first time I told him, strike the rock. That was the impression of Christ being stroken for our sins. And he's being beaten for our sins and being crucified for our sins. And out of that came the water that Israel was needing. But the second time, I told him to speak to the rock because the sacrifice of being crucified has been finished now. And all you need to do is now speak to the rock, which is Christ, that the living waters will flow all of it. Don't, 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 don't beat it. Don't sacrifice it. Just speak to it. 
And so many times we are missing our destiny and we're missing our purpose because we feel that we need to, out of the frustrations of the lack of response or the, the murmuring of people around us, we need to strike again and again and again so that the living waters will come forth. And by the way, the water came forth, but Moses lost his destiny <laughs> because he was frustrated with people. Don't let nobody frustrate you enough that you will miss your destiny in Christ. Just because people don't receive you doesn't mean that God is not doing his will. Amen? Just because people don't receive you doesn't mean God doesn't, is not doing his will. God will do his will one way or another. Whether we like it or not, his will be done. As Jesus our Lord and Savior taught us, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> And then at the end of it, we said, Amen. So you know what that word Amen means, by the way? So be it. So be it. So we all declared, so be it on earth, as in his heaven, when we say Amen. So be careful, by the way, when, every, when, when you, you, you say Amen to whatever you hear, every jabberish you hear, because when you say Amen, here's what happens. You declare it, so be it. You're confessing in agreement. It's a so be it word, right? And people always say, amen, amen, amen. Sometimes I say somebody died. Amen. <laughs> you know, I, I, I get this all the time in church. It's, it's, it's hilarious, you know. People sometimes don't even listen to what you're saying. They just say that every, every pause moment that comes out of the preacher's mouth is amen. And the brother so-and-so is dealing with some life issues. Amen. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that was an amen moment. This was a... Prayer moment, you know, <laughs> this was a moment that we, we, you know, or, or, you know, you tell, well, you know, so, so this, this terrible thing happened. Hallelujah! <laughs> you know? And you're like, wow, are you really listening what is being shared and preached? So the thing is, here's, here's what is taking place. And, and, and I want you to understand because the Lord said to me, he says, I didn't ask us. He didn't ask us to sacrifice anything for this world. He said to us, offer your life as a living sacrifice. What does that mean, offer your life as a living sacrifice unto him? What does that really entail when this Bible says, offer your life as a living sacrifice? It literally means doing what he wants us to do regardless regardless of the opposition regardless of where it's going because god has a plan and his plan is perfect and and when we when we try to convey and convince and try to change the world by the iron fist and by the way Sometimes the iron fist is not us. We Bible thumb people. We actually not speaking to Christ. Because God said to Moses, speak to the rock, which is Christ. Let the living waters, let the waters come out of it. Let the waters come out of it. Because when we, when we understand that context of the scripture, it means that when we have, we have authority in Jesus' name to speak into things, and those things will take place. And he said, speak to the rock. He didn't say speak unto, Mo, unto Israel. Isn't that fascinating? Speak to the rock, not to Israel, not to the congregation. Speak to the rock, because the rock will flood all with him. John 17, we read Tuesday, I will give them my joy and my joy shall remain in them and my joy will do what? Make them righteous. Not we are making him, making ourselves righteous, but he makes us righteous. Isn't that amazing how the Lord works in all of these things? He makes us righteous. And, and he say, when we start talking to the Lord, and we start moving in the Lord. And we stop 
attacking things in the Lord, the Lord will do the things on our behalf. Amen? This is what happens. It's reality. And he says, speak to the rock. God had never, at no point, he said, speak to the congregation of Israel. He says, speak to the rock. And, and, and as he was revealing this to me, as he was speaking this to me, he says, Ali, your frustrations in the world is because you're trying to make people understand. But you're not speaking to me. And that's why whatever you're touching, things go wrong. I needed you to go through this process for you to understand. The reason everything is going wrong is because you are just speaking to them, not to me. I reveal that you can release the flight gates of heaven on earth as it is in heaven. Don't worry about the timing. Be obedient to declaring my word. And isn't it amazing that we, we may, many times of us, we feel ourselves that are so liberated. By the way, people that think they are liberated, actually, we are not that liberated either. Many of us, I think we are so free in our ways in the Lord. Actually, we are much more in bondage in our ways than the, the people who are not in the Lord. Because you know what? Those who are not in the Lord, they don't have nothing to worry. We worry way too much about things. We worry about too many things. And the Bible says, do not be anxious for nothing. Do not be anxious for nothing. But in everything that you do, do it in prayer and supplication. Unto who? In unto who? Unto who? Unto the Lord. Amen? Do it unto the Lord. And watch the Lord how he will do all things. And you know, the anxiety, you know, and I was sharing on this on Tuesday, the, the spirit of anxiety, that, the spirit of worry and stress that is in us, is self-afflicted, not by the enemy. It's self-affliction. The enemy has no power. We self-afflicted because we desire to see things happen. Boom, 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 boom. And, and we, don't, we don't have time, and then we miss our destiny. <laughs> and, and then when the Lord says, says, do not, do not sacrifice the directions and the ways that I've spoken for the purpose of the gain of people. Hey, that does something for you. And at the same time, he says, don't talk to them, talk to me. Don't talk to them, talk to me. Because out of their bellies shall flow rivers of living waters. That's what shall happen. Which was so exciting because it ties right into the message that the Lord had spoken to my heart. Uh, and I wanted to really preach it on the Tuesday because there was a beautiful jewelry worn by Sister Emery that... <laughs> I could not contain myself, you know. I could not contain myself. I begged God. I said, God, please allow me to preach this message today. Today, she's wearing it. It's perfect. It's in its perfect ways and all things. And the Lord says, no. It's for Sunday. <laughs> now I know why. Because there was a part that he needed to add on to it for me to understand. Uh, turn with me, your Bibles, uh, to uh, the book of Exodus chapter 16, and uh, we're going to be reading the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 16, and we're just going to be reading from verse 2 onwards, and it reads, and the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, would, God, would, would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and 
when we did eat bread of the full. For ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel at the at even then you shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of from the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. For hear there your murmuring against the Lord. And I and what are we that ye are murmur against us? Our Father in heaven, we exalt your holy name. We thank you for your word. Deliver your word this morning powerfully unto your people. Set us free, O Lord God, from our mindsets. Renew us in you that we can follow you daily accordingly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The scripture addresses an issue with the children of Israel that I would love to address this morning with the body of Christ. It says, the congregation gathered together, sitting together, and murmured against Aaron and Moses, Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They murmured against the will of God and the ways of God, why God would bring them so much out of this place. And you know, it is interesting that the murmuring of the saints has not stopped yet. The murmuring of the saints continues daily in their lives because we do not comprehend the directions that the Lord leads those who are supposed to lead us. And we are, we are, we, we are very quick to judge and fall into judgment of, of declaring what it should be like or should not be like. My brothers, my sisters, I want to submit to you this, that God had even appointed and anointed heathen kings to rule over his people. It's the Bible. It's not Ali's words. It's the Bible. And God has his ways. God took the Babylonian king to rule over the children of Israel for 70 years. God's will. Not, not the devil's will, by the way, in case you did not know. Because God speaks in his word to his prophet. His prophet asks him, says, God, can you please tell me what you are about to do? God says, even if I tell you, you won't get it. He says, no, I beg you, tell me. He says, okay, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to put Israel in 70 years of captivity. What? I thought you were the God of Israel who you love so much. He says, but it's necessary for them to go 70 years in captivity because I am going to make the king, I call him King Nap because his name is too difficult to roll off my ten tongues, you know. I, I still trying to perfect the tongues of English, you know. Uh, but uh, I call him King Nap. He says, I'm going to choose King Nap to rule over my people. I'm going to allow him to take him into captivity. And the prophet has no authority to come and say, no, we are not going to go that direction. And he has no authority to even get the people of God to turn away from the things that God has already foreordained and put in motion. And we have to understand that the prophet stepped back and watched the ways of the Lord to be fulfilled. And we need to have that same understanding. And Israel could have complained. Israel could have murmured. Israel could have come and said, Hey, listen, yo, man, what's your problem? Why didn't you warn us? Why didn't you tell us about these things? 
which they did, by the way, because when they were in the 70 years of captivity, they started complaining and crying and whatever be the case. But God, from one side, warned them through Jeremiah, but from the other side, he says, let it be so. So God chose the captivity. Sometimes we think it's the enemy that chooses the captivity, but it is the awakening that comes through the captivity that can only happen when God does things. And, and we don't understand the ways of the Lord, and the Lord has chosen leaders and people to lead us even the bad leaders to direct us towards the Lord. That's why I shared last week, be careful what you, where you put your mouth. Be careful who you put your mouth on because you never know who God is using to lead you into his pathway, even in the wrong leadership. Even in the wrong leadership, folks, God is on his throne. He is still the king of this world. He is still the king of kings. He is still the Lord of lords. He is still the author and the finisher of our faith. He knows already what is going to happen next. And he is not worried, neither is he wondering, because he knows all things are working out for good for those who are called according to his will and his purpose. All things, not some things, not well, the, the things. All things are working for, for good. And, and here it is, the Lord is doing this. And uh, I shared this before with you, and I, I want to share this again with you because I want you to understand this thing. The Lord spoke this thing so wonderfully to them. And I remember when I was going through the tragedies of the shifting of where God was leading me as a pastor, as an apostle, as a leader. God spoke through a man that is a man of honor, military, a man of status. Now, you have to be as young as I am to understand that and who this person is. Uh, I was reading the book of um, uh, General Schwarzkopf. Now, Edward Schwarz who? Well, I'm glad you do not know him because you're young. If you're old like me, young like me, then you would know who General Schwarzkopf is. General Schwarzkopf was the lead general to liberate Kuwait out of the hand of Saddam's invasion of, uh, 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 of the Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. And he was the one that led the Allies to do it quickly and as least as possible casualty to people. And the ass in his in his book, the, he wrote that he says there's some, the, the, there was an interviewer that asked him, "Who were your great leaders that taught you how to do such a great operation, to have the least casualty on both sides, and liberate people's life so wonderfully, leading the Allies army?" And he says, "My response to that." interviewer was as following. I had a lot of bad leaders who taught me what not to do. Therefore, I was able to lead the right way. <laughs> and that word, the whole book, I don't remember anything else except that one thing. That I read the whole book for that one specific thing. Thank you, Lord, for every bad leader of my life. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that is not doing what they're supposed to do. And thank you for allowing me to submit myself. Because he was writing down, he says, he submitted himself for years under the authority of these bad leaders. Because he was learning while he was being quiet. Right. Until it was his time to shine. Until it was his time to be giving the rain to do what only he could do. But until that time... He didn't provoke, he didn't move, he didn't shift, he didn't start causing because he was learning. And we need to learn constantly from the Lord. And the Lord says, that's why, speak to the rock. Don't speak. They were murmuring to each other. They were complaining to each other. Oh, is this the way of the Lord? Why did Moses bring us this far out? Why did he do this to us? Wasn't enough graves in the day? And it's interesting. They didn't do it one time. They didn't do it two times. They didn't do it three times. They constantly did this. And isn't it interesting that they said the same thing at the gates of the Red Sea beforehand. They said to Moses, it wasn't there enough graves in, in Egypt for us to be buried in Egypt. Why did you bring us out here to die? die? Why did you do this? And God 
spoke to Moses at that time and says, why are you complaining? Remember the message I was preaching? If we listen to people who are complaining, we are actually as guilty as people who are complaining. Moses never said a word to, to, them, to God. He never complained to the Lord. They were complaining, and Moses' response was what was the Lord was saying. The Moses said, hey, behold, today is the day of salvation. Today will be delivered. His message was, amen, God is with us. And then God says, hey, Moses, why are you complaining? I never complained. Yes, you did. You listened to them. <laughs> but this time, he wasn't listening to them, if you pay attention to the text. This time, he was spending time with the Lord. And as they were murmuring, the Lord says how to deal with it properly. How to deal with things. Be careful. I always share this. I share this over and over again. And people get sometimes offended. They say, oh, well, you know, you, you're telling people not to listen to me. No, I didn't say people don't listen to me. I said listen to the spirit behind it. <laughs> Be careful who you're listening to. Whoever you give your ears to, that person actually will cause you to become like them, even you don't believe in them. Just like Moses did. God rebuked Moses. God didn't rebuke Israel. God rebuked Moses. Why are you complaining? What is in your hand? What is the staff? What is this? So God started rebuking Moses. And here it is again, these children of Israel, these wonderful children of Israel that God constantly, after 490 years of slavery, folks, 490 years, I do not know whether you understand what 490 years looks like. We couldn't even deal with two years of being locked out. <laughs> they were, and we weren't even, in fact, we weren't even slave, beaten up to work hard, to pay in the uh, concentration camps. This guy's been 490 years, generation after generation after generation, after all the blessings that they had received, suddenly pff, deflated. After 490 years of slavery, of the, under the Egyptian control, God says, I'm freeing you. And they come, they complain at the Red Sea. And then they get across, and then they start celebrating. They start celebrating, singing of the salvation of the Lord. Two days ago, they were complaining. Is there no grave enough in Egypt for us to be buried? And then two days later, they're across the Red Sea. They're celebrating God. Oh, hallelujah, glory to God. We are free. Yes, we are free indeed. Boom, boom, boom. And then a few days later again, complaining again. Complaining, murmuring, saying, oh my gosh, wasn't there enough graves in Egypt? You know what? At least when we were slaves in Israel, we had pots of meat and we were eating some meat. And we were eating all these things, you know. You know. We were eating some good meat, you know. And all these wonderful meats that we were eating and the bread, you know. At least if we were going to die, we had some meat. Some flesh. And if we died, we died happy. At least. We die miserably in the, in, the, in the wilderness and no meat. This is not my piece of jewelry. This is Admiral's piece of jewelry. I'm just borrowing it. It was weird like this on, on, on Tuesday. She had it all nicely twisted together. And I'm like, I had to excuse myself for a few seconds out of the service because the humor of it was so much in my mind that I, I could not disturb the service. I had to walk out of the service and, and, and just pray and beg God, God, please let me preach this message today. And he goes, mm, go back, you know, preaching that message. Don't look even at, onto her, you know. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it, it's funny how God confirms his words once in a while, right? God delivered them out of Egypt, but they were not delivered from slavery. God delivered them from Egypt, but their mind was enslaved. They still were bound to Egypt's gifts, provision, joy, 
and everything else. They were wearing an invisible chain now around their necks. They were wearing bling bling. <laughs> you know, they were blinging it. You know, they were bling this chain that they were wearing upon their necks that they weren't watching this bling. I was thinking today on the way here, I was praying. God took me an extra route to pray because I, I was spending some time in prayer and I'm getting, and the Lord says, go for a little more drive, you know, and I know why he took me for another little drive. And I saw, I saw, uh, I saw a Ferrari and I saw a Lamborghini on the road and I was looking at the both of them and, I, and God says, do you know how stupid Ferrari is? I said, what God? He says, do you know how stupid Ferrari is? I said, God, please explain. He says, Ferrari had the chance so many times to become the greatest vehicle in the world. And every time they rejected it because they were stubborn that they want to do their own will. I said, you know, God, because I love cars and I love sports, God talks to me about different things, you know, uh, through different, different ways, right? And, you know, uh, and I love cars, by the way. And Daniel can tell you how much I love cars. Uh, he, his car does things that he did not know Abel is able to do, you know. <laughs> I won't tell you what I was doing with the car because there might be people watching that are working for the other side. <laughs> they might be having a conversation with me afterwards, <laughs> you know. And I said, God, please explain. He says, look, Ferrari. What we today, we, we really love those cars. We call it the Mustang Shelby's. You know, it's a great car, right? Everybody says, oh, it's a power car, right? But do you know that Shelby went actually to Ferrari first and offered their wisdom and knowledge how to expand their vehicles and make them a better car? And Ferrari looked at it and said, so you dumb Americans, get out of here. We don't want to hear, hear you. You don't have nothing to do with, you don't know how to do things with the engine. And of course, Mustang Shelby is birth, as we know today. Then, then this little tractor driver in, in, in Italy looks at the Ferrari and says, let me, let me give you some insight how to make your car better. And then Ferrari says, oh, you're just a tractor driver. Why should I listen to you? I don't care. And then we have Lamborghini. <laughs> and then the whole world was shifting into this whole crossover SUV world of the greatness. And then Ferrari refused to bring the first SUV or crossover. Lamborghini brought it, Porsche brought it, all of them brought it, except Ferrari. And now Ferrari last year decided to bring their version, and nobody's buying it. It is the fact that when God brings things, and, and, and sometimes we act like that, we, we, know, we think we know better than everybody else because something is working for us. Ferrari things are working. Yes, for sure things are working. But his mindset, the mindset is still not delivered. The mindset's still there. And that's why the scripture says, it is by renewing of our mind. We need to renew our mind. And, and, and here's Israel. They're still in chains. They're still complaining. They're still murmuring about Moses in the wilderness. We want meat. We want to have meat and we want to eat meat and God reveals the murmuring. And my brothers, my sisters, I want to submit to you something today this morning. God is listening to all our hearts. God is listening to all our complaints. He's listening to all our murmurings. He's listening to all our gossip and he is not pleased with them. Because God says, I have an order in my kingdom. And I put things in function as I desire. And I'm leading. I'm not enslaving. You know what religion has done to us? It has enslaved us. The text tells us that you will have so much food that you will, be contained, you will have the glory of the Lord upon you. He's talking about Jesus, the bread of life. You will have so much manna from heaven. You will have so much of Jesus in you that the glory of the Lord will be with you. But this 
slaveness has become their joy, their strength. It's their, what they desire to walk in. It's what makes them feel confident, makes them comfortable, because this is my comfort right here. This is my comfort right here. This is my comfort right here. And I wonder how many of us are comfortable in the ways that we know. As much as we think we are liberated, we are actually not. As much as we think we are free, we are not. Because we are so set in our minds, in our ways, that this is what I want. That we are not watching and seeing that God is perhaps working differently and is functioning differently and God's ways are higher mind than my ways and he knows things much better even if it includes that we got to go through a season of trouble it is well with my soul and interesting enough please understand that the things that you love so much including the things that you treasure so much can become your God God bless them, my brothers. God bless them with jewelry, with silver, with all sorts of things. He gave them everything. Be careful about your blessings because they can turn to become your curse. Be careful about your blessings because they can become your curse and you will worship your blessings and you're not going to worship Him. And I saw... You know, the, the, the Lord spoke to me this many years ago. He says, I gave Israel all the gold and silver they needed. And I told my leader, I told Moses, come and see me face to face. And, Mo, and I said, bring Israel with you. Israel didn't want to come with me. Didn't want to come with the, they were scared to see God. And then they, they thought Moses was dead up there. What did they do? They grabbed their blessing. They grabbed their blessing and they melted and they went back to slavery of worshiping idols. They worshiped idols again because they were comfort in the mindset of their slavery that they went back immediately to what they were comfortable in. It's amazing how animals always will find a way to their comfortable place when they're scared. And humans are not too far away from it either. That's why we run to sin. Every time trouble starts up. That's why we turn into all sorts of things except God. Drugs, alcohol, profanity, whatever you can imagine. Because it brings comfort to our flesh. I heard a story about this... this, uh, owner of a dog in Texas, he's, he, he donated his dog, he gave his dog to another uh, farmer, which was about half an hour drive away from his house. And his dog, who he had, whenever there was thunderstorms, he would always run into the barn and hide himself in the corner of a barn. And years have passed since then. And thunderstorm comes suddenly out of nowhere and he was standing in his kitchen drinking his coffee and he said he couldn't believe it he saw there's a dog running and he looked at his wife and says honey could it be that it is Jimmy he says no it cannot be and they saw this dog running full speed and went right into the barn in the corner where he was usually hiding when thunderstorm came. Years have passed, but the dog didn't forget where his comfort is in the thunderstorm. Run for over half an hour, even more, because driving is half an hour. Probably run over an hour. Went through the storms and the thunderstorms to find his comfort in the place that he had because the mind was there, the comfort is in the the stable where I usually go. And the same thing happens to us because once we have not forgotten what is behind us, 
we will always run back to what we used to know. And I'm not talking about sin, folks. I'm talking about our religious ways. I'm talking about when the glory of the Lord wants to arise in us and wants to move through us. That's what happens. And you know how the enemy does that? He grabs our blessing and he puts it shiny around our necks. He takes our experiences and makes them as golden honor that we have. He puts it on our necks. Come, Daniel. I can do this with you. And then we go around and talk about, oh, how wonderful the glory of the Lord is with us. And going, declaring, I know better. I know better than Moses. I know better than everybody else. I just know. I just don't. I just know. And the enemy allows us to go in our knowings and move in our knowings. And we will succeed in our knowings until the encounter with the Lord is coming. Where are you going? Uh uh. You're not going anywhere. And then when we, and then he gets our focus back on what we know, what we understand, how we like things. And then he lets us all go and he walks around us. And then as soon as we're trying to go again and there's an encounter, and you go, ah, where are you going? He's taking our very blessings and he holds us by them. He's not holding us by the sins of the world or the ways of the Lord. He's stopping us by disobedience of the way of the Lord. The ways of the Lord are perfect. It doesn't make sense to our flesh because our flesh is emotional. But his ways is not emotional. His ways are perfect in all its ways. And you know, and this is what the Lord wants to do for us many times. He wants to come. He wants to put us or his joy in us that makes us righteous. He wants us to be righteous and he wants us to be righteous that way. Don't go anywhere. And he wants to take this off of us and put it away. And he wants to remove it from us. And he wants to cover us in his glory. I need like two, three big guys to come and help me. Tall guys, big guys. Come, Tony. Come. Omo, come, Vic. You stay in the middle. Let me get a couple more people. Huh? Let me get Chad. And. No, leave Eric. Eric's short. No. <laughs> That's a talk. And let, uh, let me get Attila, you know. Let me get Attila. Come. Just stand here. And let's, and let's call this, let's call this the presence of God. Them. I will charge angels over your life. That they will guide you, direct you. And let's call this the presence of God. The angels are there. And, and the presence of God, you guys hold hands and move together. And, 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 and then, yeah, move, move. And as they're moving, you move with them. And that as the presence of the Lord is moving, whatever direction the presence of the Lord is moving, is forcing us to move in His pre- in His way. But guess who is right there in the present, in, in there watching? The adversary, the accuser of the brethren. He's standing there and looking. He can enter in the presence of the Lord. He can go where the Lord is. He cannot do anything where the Lord is. But he's watching. And he's going wherever they're moving. And he's watching closely. And he's watching all over the place where they're moving around. And he's, as, they're, as they're moving in the Lord, as the angels are charging people, you know, go, go that direction. Just keep on moving, walking in different directions. And he's watching and he's watching and he's watching and watching. And then comes the moment. And he's not watching just by watching. He's watching with what we know and cherish so much. And, we, and he's watching. And, and he cannot can enter in there, but he tingles the bling bling, the, the glory, the knowledge, the wisdom that we have. And, 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 and we are, but as long as we are focused 
on the presence of the Lord, we don't see this. But he is there. The adversary is there. He is like a roaring lion. He is there willing to steal and kill and destroy whomsoever is willing. He cannot come into the will of God. But he can. No, no, just keep it. But he can leave the will of God. And it's like this. Thank you so much. You're good now. You're with me. Thank you, guys. And he puts it back on us. And it is glorious for a moment because now you are not moving based on how the Lord is moving. Now you're free to move whatever direction you want to move. You can go wherever you want to go, come back wherever you want to come back, and there is no order over our lives. God put everything in order, my brothers and my sisters. Keep on walking, then eventually end up beside me. There's an order over our lives. God has put orders because God wants also to judge the world, by the way. Just in case you did not know, God uses us to judge the world. Just in case you did not know. Stop. And the Lord says, the, the, then they came to, Peter came, and the Pharisees came, and people came to Jesus, and they asked Jesus, hey, Jesus, by the way, shall we be paying taxes? The Pharisees asked, shall we pay taxes to Rome? And Jesus said, show me the coin that you hold in your hand. Whose face is it on? Caesar. Give to Caesar what it belongs to Caesar. God says there's an order. I need to fix this order. And as long as this order I have placed, because I'm using this as a judgment against the world, you need to fulfill all righteousness. And then he comes to Peter and says, go find in the mouth of the fish gold and you will pay all our taxes. Because God says, I'm putting in order. It's about the judgment I'm bringing. It's not your, up to you to decide what to do and what not to do. It's up to me to deal with it. You stay obedient to my ways. I don't want to do that. No problem. Continue going. We cheat on our taxes. Oh. Sorry, I'm Mary. We're going to sing. We're going to sing after this. After <laughs> breaking every chain. <laughs> breaking every chain. <laughs> I hear chains are breaking. <laughs> No, it's not fixable. <laughs> she may be able to fix it. <laughs> Here. <laughs> My mom just said it's the will of God <laughs> in Farsi. <laughs> <sighs> I hope you get this illustration that the Lord is putting before us. This illustration that how it is the enemy is, gets us into the murmuring in our thoughts, in our ways, and he's, he, and he's coming against the will of God and it gets us to worship what we are blessed by. We're not supposed to worship what we're blessed by. We're not supposed to be wanting the things that God doesn't want us to have. We shouldn't be covetous against the things that others have. God will bless certain people in a certain way. God will do things for different people in a different way because he knows everybody accordingly. Which reminds me, by the way, anybody has $12 that I can borrow? I need to pay something after service. Yeah, I just need $12. I don't know if anybody has $12 this morning. Does anybody have $12? Two fives and a two. Two fives and a two. Oh, thank you. Praise God. Stop. Stop right here. Wait. It's interesting. I knew it would be her. I knew it would be her already before I came to church. Because before I came to church, the Lord sent me to the bank. And he told me, he says, I want to do something. Because the last time I was doing 
another illustration with money, it was her again. <laughs> and the Lord told me, and, and I, I, went, I went outside, and I told the Lord, I said, because the Lord told me, he says, he says, you're going to do something today because I want to demonstrate to my people when we're willing to give back to God what belongs to God. He will pour out much more into our hands without complaining. I, was, I said outside to Annie, and I said, Annie, go give this $12 to a mother in the church and tell them exactly the Lord God wants you to have this. And I, told, I didn't tell Annie to tell me who it is because I, wanted, I was just watching, and I saw Annie going there and give it to Maria, and she was crying, and I knew she would give it to her. I knew it. It was just a confirmation, because it was a confirmation upon confirmation upon confirmation. And the Lord says, when you give it to her, I'm going to give it to her to show everybody, those who have a pure heart after me, they will never hold back what, that's, what the Lord gives them. And the Lord says, the moment, she says, if anybody else does it, don't do this. But the moment that she does it, you will show everybody what I'm trying to do. And the Lord said, in your obedience, he will make it a hundredfold. Amen. Because it belongs to you. You didn't hold on to things. That is, you saw as a blessing. You saw him as a blessing. Amen. And this is how God operates. Bless you. And this is how God is operating with us. He operates with us. He says, don't hold the things of the thing, the blessings that I'm giving you. Release the blessings because I have so much manifold that I want to give to you. I want to pour out more into your hands. I want to give more than you. I want to give you a hundredfold, a thousandfold. I want to do much more, but you're worrying about the little that you can take back from this world. That's why we cheat on our taxes. I know taxes is over. But we shouldn't be cheating on our taxes. <laughs> because the blessing is not the tax return. The blessing is the obedience to the Lord. Amen. The blessing is not the work. It's obedient to be working <laughs> unto the Lord. That's what the blessings are. That's where the blessings flow. And this is how God works. And this is what we do so many times with God. God is asking us for only a portion for our obedience. And we're holding this portion of obedience so tight in our hand. You fixed it? Wow, don't fix it. It's supposed to break every chain. <laughs> but we'll be holding these things. And, and we're holding, we, 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 we covetous the things that we love the most so much in our life. That we're missing the, pro, the, the blessing that the Lord has in our hearts. Folks, I'm telling you this. I, I, we went last Sunday after service to look at a car for Daniel. Beautiful car. Honda, you know, Civic, SI, you know, VTEC, you know, all the whole nine, six, six gear, fully decked. I test drove it. I was trying to be nice to the guy. Didn't want to get him scared how fast I can drive and how things I can do with the car. And I said, wow, this is such a good car. My goodness, I love this car. You know, and then Tuesday night, we went out, we drove a little bit in the, with the car, and then we did some stuff with the car that, you know, drift the car, move around, park the car with full speed, you know, all those things, right? And my endurance, and was like, wow, I want this so much. And then I was looking at the Subaru SW, S, uh, WR, uh, WRX, and I said, I'm going to buy this car. I want this car. Daniel cannot drive faster than me. I have to drive fast. I need to show him what it can happen. And Friday, again, I wanted it so badly. I said, let me go for a little drive and little drive and little drive. And then suddenly in the middle of the drive, the Lord says, park the car. Tell him to drive it. You covetousing. Somebody else's blessing. And I said, Daniel, don't ever give me your car to drive. <laughs> We do it unconsciously, folks. I'm telling you, it is in our mindset. It's the slavery that is in our mindset. We don't even notice it. We call it our rights. I feel I earned to drive a nice car and drive, drive a you know, sports car. I earned it. I, I earned to spend at least that much money on myself to drive a nice sports car. And the Lord says, 
I didn't tell you to drive a sports car. I told you to serve my kingdom. Because you cannot do the things I did with this car in an SUV. It will for sure flip over. <laughs> and you will be hearing us about the 6 o'clock news about what happened to us. <laughs> but that's what happens. It's the slavery of our mindset that happens. And the Lord wants to deliver us from that slavery of our mindset. It's not about our rights. It's not about what we can. It's about what He wants. The Bible says to us, all things are permissible. Not everything is beneficial. All things are permissible. It is the sum. It's all things are permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Just because it's permissible doesn't mean it's beneficial. And I thank the Lord that He took that desire away from me on Friday. He told me to park the car because, you know what, I'm, I get a ticket. I cannot even do ministry anymore. My license is gone, you know, because the speed I was going, I confess before the Lord, it wasn't like 20 kilometers over speed limit. It was like 50 to 80 kilometers. It was like 170, 170 kilometers per hour on a highway, you know. You didn't even notice how fast you were. It means your license lost, $1,000 ticket, and all those things, right? And I said, okay, Lord, Amen. <laughs> Resist the devil, and he will flee away. Resist the devil, he will flee away. And I'm not the only one, by the way, going through these struggles. Don't get me wrong. There are other people that are willing to confess that they're going through the same struggles. You know, he gave me permission. Attila goes through the same struggle. You know, he wanted to buy himself a bike. He wanted to buy himself a nice bike. You know, he, you know, because you know, there's something about speed. Is, is flirting with life and death. There is something about speed. The fact that you get away from death and you can control death and life in your hand, it makes you very excited. But that shouldn't make us excited. The Lord should make us excited. And, and, and he was going through the similar struggle. And the worst part was, he, he saw, you know, you know how we make it God sometimes? I'm telling you, we are so foolish folks. I love you all. But we're so foolish that when the, our temptation, somebody else speaks to our temptation, it's God. <laughs> it's confirmation. Because I'm sitting in the house church on Thursday, and I'm in, he doesn't know what's going on in my mind about the Subaru. And he says, oh, that's Subaru, WRX. And, you know, that. I said, oh, there is my confirmation. You know? I went home Friday, I was looking on it, I was looking on where to buy it, was looking at all of it. I'm telling you, we are so foolish that we make confirmation of our temptation based off somebody else might be tempted just like us. Yeah. <laughs> he's tempted as much as I'm tempted. And I'm making him my confirmation. Yeah. Now he's my brother, I can talk to him like that. Because he's like, he's getting offended that easily like some of you. <laughs> But that happens, you know. And then, and then I was trying to justify myself. I even talked to Brad on, on Friday. I said, oh, Brad, you know, I love bikes, you know. And in Texas, man, you don't need no helmet. You can just sit on that bike and go and go. And he was so gentle with me. Brad was so gentle with me on Friday. I said, oh, you know, Pastor, even for a few moments, I was going without my helmet and everything else. I felt like so naked and vulnerable. And he's trying to give me some wisdom in his kindness, you know. He says, you shouldn't be going on your bike without no you know equipments because it's dangerous right and in my answer i said what are you talking about it's all about this is about the, going on a bike means you are free no helmet no nothing you go the wind that comes on you right and he was so gentle but you know what he gave me a kind rebuke and i, I received his kind rebuke you know he gave me a kind rebuke he says you shouldn't be thinking about these things you know and i said well praise god thank you for our brother's love that he rebuked me kindly and says, don't play with God. <laughs> but here's the, here's the gist of what the Lord is trying to deliver to us. Remain in the presence and the glory of the Lord. Keep yourself holy in that place. Don't let your understandings or the pleasures of your life, of this life, hold you back for what God wants to deliver unto your hands. 
and don't come against the order of God. Because the order of God has to be fulfilled. Do I like it? 100% no. Do you like it? 100% no. But you know what? Before God told his prophet that he's going to put them in 70 years of slavery, he told his other prophet that I will deliver them to another king. I will bring one king to put them in slavery. But I will raise up another king in the form of Cyrus to deliver them. So God already has the plan of your deliverance before he allows things to happen. God already knows what he's already had. Before he, pl- he was going to put them seven years of slavery to draw them, to showcase, to birth out of them Daniel and all these things that God has, was doing, he, was, he already has planned 490 years before that. He prophesied, there will be a king born. His name shall be called Cyrus. He will be my king. He will be my anointed one. He will be my shepherd. And he will deliver my people out of the hand of captivity. God does not do anything anything without a plan everything that he has he has a plan just because we don't understand it that's why he told his prophet he said even if i tell you you don't get it but it's not up for you to get it it's up for me to do it it's up to you to be obedient so let us not forsake the ways of the lord just because we don't get it let us not murmur and complain like the israelites did because we don't get it Let us be obedient to the ways of the Lord and subject ourselves to His will, even if it seems unto evil. Because the Pharisees were saying, we shouldn't be paying taxes because we are Jews, we are the people of the book. And Jesus says, I put this in order that I can judge them, give to them what is given to them. Give to God what belongs to God. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Go get the gold and pay for all our taxes. Because God is trying to say, I am not after your money. I'm after your soul. Give to God what belongs to God. Give souls back to God. The money will be rubbish. I want each and every one of you to be a millionaire and billionaire in this world. But I can guarantee you one thing. Not one cent of it you can take with you to heaven. And if God allows you, like this rich man that decided to take all his wealth because his children were wicked, and God gave him a chance to turn all his wealth and bring it to heaven. And he turned it to gold bars and he brought it to heaven. And the Lord says, in all this week that I give you a chance to change your, all your wealth, you brought pavement. <laughs> the gold that we love so much in this world is pavement in heaven. We will walk on the streets of gold. I'm not talking about we shouldn't be striving towards success because God says he will prosper us on all of our ways. But he says we shouldn't be cherishing those things as our success. Our success is when we grow deep in growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Being like him, harmless as a dove, wise as a serpent. Walking in glory not in distractions. Walking in order, not in disorder. Facing the world, just like he said in John 17, they will hate us, them, because they hate me. Do not remove them out of this world, but let them remain in this world. For what purpose? For judgment. For judgment. Because God will use all these things to judge. There is a scripture in the Bible that says, God does not deliver the poor because he judges the rich. To see their hearts. God doesn't deliver the poor. People say, why, if God is so loving, why God is so many poor people? God says, because he's judging the very wealthy. The very wealthy that are willing to spend, you know, on a tank. For, forgive me. I don't think anybody in this world should be driving a G-Wagon. Mercedes G-Wagon. It's an it's a armored car for politicians and people. It's, 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 it's supposed to be a military vehicle. What business do you do that you have to drive a quarter million dollar car on the street that you cannot even afford a brake change, which is 20 grand? (laughs) It is the truth, it's 20 grand for a brake job. But it's the lust of this world. 
that we have in our heart. It's the lust of this heart. Where we want people to praise us. He's driving a G-Wagon. He's driving a Porsche. He's driving this. He's driving that. And we, we, we identify ourselves with the things that we have gained out of this world. But you know what? That's exactly the mentality of slavery. Because we want people to praise us, not praise Him. God is asking us to let all the chains to be gone. Our, our, our ways that we think that he's moving, the ways that we want to move, and let him move. Let us speak to the rock of our salvation. Let him lead us and direct us. He will lead us to all path of righteousness. I will order the step of the righteous man. I will tell them what to do. Fear not and not be dismayed. Be courageous and follow after me. So as we sing this song together this morning, let us just truly declare to the Lord, Lord, whatever it is, knowing or unknowing that I'm holding back things that I cherish in my life, even the wisdom that I have in you, that is holding me back because it's not going any further than I thought it would go. Lord, deliver me and let me allow the living waters flow through me. Lord, I will speak to the rocks of my salvation, Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of all of our lives. Lord, I will speak unto you that you can flow through Vic because, Lord, you are the Savior, the author, and the finisher of his life. I know that I can, one word from heaven will do much greater works than 10,000 words out of my mouth unto him. Help me to help him by speaking unto Jesus that lives in him. By speaking towards heaven, so heaven shall be done as in this on earth. Let us go and declare and worship the King. The book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So our warfare is not on this earth. Let us, as God breaks the chains of our understandings and wisdom, let us get to the heavenly places and do the warfare that will manifest itself on earth, as it says. I shared a testimony earlier with you to tell you what we could not accomplish in the flesh of resistance. In one prayer, in one instant, the Lord answered the nation. And I'm not saying we were the only ones. I'm sure that God, in the two entire nations, He spoke. And He gave the same heart to others, to like us. We fasted before that, if you remember, before that we fasted. That we fasted that they the, the will come, the 21-day fast that the Lord will meet us like how he met Daniel to fix the conditions of the kingdom. All those things happen because we made a choice. We will go to him. We will go to high places to tear down the power of darkness. Because no matter how much we pour, pour out the powers of darkness on this earth, another darkness will rise up because the end is near and it's clapping on our doors. So I pray in the name of Jesus that you take this in heart to heart what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, 12. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not, everybody in this world is just a tool in the hands of the plan of God. But we're fighting against principalities, authorities in dark places. And God has given us authority over all these things to speak 
to dismay and to destroy for his glory I want to encourage you in Jesus name that the Lord will move upon you mightily this morning I'm not going to pray with you I'm not going to lay hands on you this is the moment between you and God that you got to make a decision lead me O Lord direct me O Lord and I will do what you have called me to be in Jesus name and as I shared earlier this morning, you may be seated. Uh, last week I shared this as well. I, I shared with the, with, with, the, with the man of this house last week. I said, man of this house, do something nice for all women. We're not going to follow the pattern of the world just celebrating mothers. Because that's the division that we put between the, the, the very fact of who God has created women to be. We will honor who God has called every mother, every woman is, can be a mother and will be a mother. And how they will be a mother is not according to what we desire to be. They can be spiritual mothers, they can give birth later on in their life, but we are going to celebrate all mothers because that's the nature of a woman that God has created. In this moment, I, what, I, what we will do is today, and I want to I step out of the traditions and I shared last week and I shared again. I want to step off traditions and I don't want to do this thing traditionally as uh, everybody else does. Call the mothers to the front and, and bless the mothers and then pray for them and all those things. I want to be pure and holy in the ways of the Lord. Because I shared that with you yesterday and I'm going to share it again with you last week and I'm sharing it again with you today. That we are going to do as the Lord has called. And I want to charge those of you mothers who have grandmothers and mothers who have given birth to a physical children. I just want to encourage you again in the Lord. Please, we will, we will guide them to come. Just, uh, yeah, we will, we will bring them forward. They will come and receive their gift as they leave. Every woman, you will receive your gift as you leave, as they leave. But we're going to, I want to put a charge upon those of you, especially those who have... Uh, you've been you you be mother in different ways, especially those grandmas and moms today. I want to in charge you with a word that Paul spoke to Timothy: to know your gift and your call, how important it is; to know your prayers and your faith, how important it is, because you are shaping the destiny. and And I'm thanking God for uh, Lauren to bring her child to church, you know, and not you know after 25 days, not. Just say, I want to see my child grow in the faith. You know, usually people don't want to do that. They use all sorts of excuses why they cannot be in church. But I, and I praise the Lord that she made that choice because she says, I want, I want my child to grow in the Lord. And here's what the, where Paul said to Timothy. He says, wherefore, I put you in remembrance and stir up the gift of God within you and putting my, by putting my hands... For God has not given you the spirit of fear, but the power and of love and a sound mind. And we know this part of scripture very well, but we do not know verse 5 very well. Verse 5 says this, When I call in rem to remembrance the unfidgeted faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandma, Louise, and then in your mother, you, uh, Eunice, and I persuaded that it is now also in you. It went from generation to generation. It's a generational blessing. So Lauren, God bless you. Because you're imputing your faith in your child. And you're raising your child in the house of the Lord. Amen. In the ways of the Lord. And all your mothers who have done it over the time and the years... And if your child is not here today, your spiritual children, your, your children are not here today, do not worry. Because the Bible is truth. If you raise up your children in the ways of the Lord, they will come back. They will come back. And they will serve the Lord. And we are coming in agreement with you over your spiritual children, over your physical children, over your spiritual grandchildren, over your physical grandchildren. We are coming in agreement this morning. And I want to pray that over all this morning. 
And I want all of us to join faith together in Jesus' name. Father, I want to thank you for mothers, oh Lord God, that are in faith. Mothers, oh Lord God, that have been imputing righteousness and holiness and teaching, oh Lord God, and raising up their children in the way of the Lord, oh God. Father, whether our children are serving the Lord today or not, I want to honor these mothers that chose to, oh Lord God, raise their children up, oh God, in the house of the Lord. And I know, according to your word, oh God, that they will return back to the Lord. They will come back to the Lord. They will return back to the Lord. They will celebrate the Lord with us, oh Lord God. And we want to rejoice, oh Lord God. And we want to rejoice, oh God, for these faithful mothers, oh God, in spirit and in flesh, oh Lord God. These amazing mothers, grandmas, in spirit and in flesh, oh Lord God, that have put, oh Lord God, the faith of Christ in their sons and daughters. As we read, Paul speaks to Timothy. He says, I know that this unwavering faith that is in your life came down from your grandma and from your mother and now it's in you that is why I can lay my hands on you stir up the gift that is already in you and raise you up accordingly and declare that God has not given you the spirit of fear but of power love and a song Amen. and Lord I pray this morning for those of us who have mothers and grandmas yes. who are not serving the Lord you promise, oh God, in the end times, you will turn the hearts of the fathers and sons, sons and fathers unto each other. You, oh Lord God, stir us, oh Lord God, that we can draw them into your kingdom, oh Lord God. We have mothers and we have grandmas that are not serving the Lord, and the world is celebrating today the way they're celebrating. But Lord, let it be today that we truly, oh Lord God, have a heart of prayer that we say, God, bring those mothers in the physical that we have, those grandmas that we have in physical, that are not serving you, Lord. Lord, bring them back. Save them. If they served you, praise God. If they are walked away from you, bring them back today, Lord. Today is a good day to intercede on their behalf because they've sown so much in our lives that for them to perish is not good. So we pray this morning for those mothers who have fallen on the sideways, grandmas that who have fallen on the sideways, oh God, backslidden in their ways, oh Lord God. We pray, oh Lord God, for those who do not know you, that they will come to know you because your word is earnest and honest. You said one member in the family is saved, the rest shall follow. And we are lifting up that prayer this morning, oh Lord God. And we declare, oh Lord God, that this shall take place. Lord God, save, sanctify our daughter-in-laws and uh, all sorts of in-laws and outlaws, oh Lord God. That we can, oh Lord God, see the glory of the Lord bestowed upon them. Our daughters that do not know you, that need to know you. This is our heart, oh God, today as we celebrate those who have, you have created in the image and likeness of yourself. Amen. He created them male and female. Yes. And we know that every woman you have created is to be fruitful and multiply. Amen. And that's what we celebrate, Amen. the multiplication of life Amen. that you have gifted us. Amen. So we thank you for all the faithful mothers faithful grandmothers that have been serving the house of the Lord and we celebrate them as well as well Lord this is a token of our love to the faithfulness of every woman that is in this house as we give these gifts unto them O oh Lord God we are giving it because O oh Lord we desire to show honor where honor is due and celebrate their faithfulness unto you not unto us not unto their family but unto you so we thank you today and no lord god for those men who have had an ear to hear what i shared this last week to bless uh, to bless the ladies one or two or all doesn't matter lord god just bless their faithfulness as well Amen. we thank you in jesus name we pray Amen. 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 All right. Amen.